A construction worker in London realized one day that manual labor was not his destiny. This is his story. This week's guest was a construction worker in London that had a realization that this wasn't where he was meant to be in life. He started trying then to find ways to talk to wealthy people. What made them wealthy, but not him? He bounced around a lot of different jobs trying to find his groove, insurance, cake sales, garden work. Eventually, he ran a concierge service, making the impossible possible. He helps his clients walk the red carpet at Sir Elton John's Oscar party, get married at the Vatican, and dive to the wreck of the Titanic. His book is called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, because he is an expert on making it happen and personal branding. And you know, someone that I really admire, Genius Network founder Joe Polish, said, if you can dream it, Steve Sims is the guy who can make it happen. So, hey, it's great to have you here. Welcome to GRE, Steve Sims. Oh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And now, Blue Fishing, the name of your book, what does that refer to? It sounds like I'm trying to catch a marlin or something. Do you know, we had no idea. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's honestly to that. When we started throwing private parties, we used to, we found it very interesting that people loved passwords. So we would say, hey, the party's over there. And you've got to say this password for the night. And people really like that. So we started coming up with stupid passwords. And one of them was finish the sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. So people would walk up, quote the classic Dr. Zeus poem and go, blue fish. And they'd get in. Now, the funny thing is, it was one of like 10 different passwords we were using, but I think we probably ended up using this one maybe too many times. And because we always did really good parties or really good events or really good experiences, people started saying to me, hey, I had a party for my daughter and I blue fished it. Or I went to a concert and I blue fished my way back uh, backstage to meet Taylor Swift. All of a sudden, it became an adjective. It became an action statement. Um, and we, di we didn't know where it came from. In fact, it was years later that we actually realized there was even a fish blue fish outside of the Dr. Zeus novel. <laughs> um, but by that time, it had stuck. So blue fishing became the adjective of when you've got something but how can you add some sparkle to it? So blue fishing, kind of leveling up your game. And really, you know, to get back closer to the origin, Steve, it sounds like perhaps that's part of your path. When you were a bricklayer in London and you're trying to get around wealthy people and find out what they were doing, leveling up, and you didn't find out until later on, perhaps that was called blue fishing. So you know, tell us about those, how, where those conversations led you when you were getting around wealthy people and getting in conversations with them, trying to learn about how they were wealthy, but you weren't at the time. Well, obviously the conversations were bad. Um, and I say obviously because every time we do anything, it's terrible compared to how it is two years later. Right. You know, your, your, your podcast, you're a great podcast, you're a great podcast host, but I'm going to put money on the fact that the first podcast you ever did was slightly embarrassing. Oh, don't even go back and listen. Yeah. Right, exactly. So the first time we do anything <laughs> is bad. I was an aggravated, and it wasn't pretty, I was an aggravated young man with no money riding around on a motorcycle. And I was aggravated because I wouldn't settle for where I was. So you combine that with my boisterous, slightly aggressive image uh, and look, it, it, it wasn't a good thing to have. Um, and I would help people get into nightclubs and I would try and spark up conversations with affluent people. And I would say, hey, I've got a question for you. So my tongue was very abrupt. And I'd be like, hey, I need to ask you. How come you're rich and I'm not? <laughs> and of course, the tonality of which I, I, I entered into that conversation, that was bad. The pace, the temper, it was horrible. But also the question was bad. Because you see, when I ask you how rich are you, you start thinking about a number. Most people correlate being rich with a number, sure whether do. it be the bank account, how much assets. they It's a number. And so it makes you feel uncomfortable. You know, I say, how rich are you? And it's like, you know, oh, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable about answering that question. So I didn't get very good response. 
So then the next time I started pe- speaking to people, I would say, hey, I need to ask you, uh, how come you're wealthy and I'm not? And I thought by changing that Better. word, that would help. Yeah. Then I started getting into a conversation, but the conversations were like, well, wealth is family. And I met my wife when she was 21 and I, I found the Lord and I do, I do line dancing in, in my local uh, um, country club. And, and I'm thinking, I'm going, well, I'm not going to do line dancing or marry your wife. So that doesn't help me. <laughs> And so, again, it was the wrong question to get the tactics, hacks, and techniques that I needed. So I, I, I very quickly learned that if you don't ask the question, if you don't like the answer, it's probably because you're asking the wrong question. Right. You want a better answer? Ask better questions. Bingo. So I started looking at it, and I start. well, I ask Rich, it's money. I ask wealth, it's lifestyle. Um, what's the mi- – success. Let's try that. And so by now I'm starting to slow down my tempo and I'm like, Hey, I've got to be asking you, um, how come you're successful and I'm not? And people are actually very happy with it. People are very happy. I ask you, Hey, yeah, how do you quantify success? Or what do you think makes you successful? Or what do you think your unicorn is to make you successful? You actually want to tell me you actually, well, you know, funny enough, it's, it's how I treat people, or it's how I go into a business deal, or it's, it's how I look at money and the impact. But all of a sudden, I'm getting answers, and I'm actually getting the tactics. So that was it. Third one, uh, home run. What makes you successful, and I'm not? Now, those were the first questions I used to ask. What idiot is going to gain that information and then not actually action it? Now, I may be slightly stupid, but I'm not that big a moron. So as people are telling me how, how to kind of like face opportunity and handle people and learn how to treat people properly, I'm actioning it. And the byproduct of a successful mentality is income. You know, it's like, it's like you want to lose weight. You don't lose weight by buying a diet book. You lose weight by actioning the articles in the diet book. Losing weight is a reaction to action. Getting money is a reaction to being successful. And success literally starts the second you adopt a successful mindset. And that was as simple as it was. And, of course, as I grew and started speaking with everyone from, you know, the Archbishop of St. Peter's to Elon Musk and Richard Branson and all of these other kind of people all around the planet, out and John, I was able to go, hey, how do you view success? Or how come you're successful when so many other people are not? I was able to take myself out of that equation because I was now, as I believe I am, a successful mindset. You're asking better questions. You're getting better answers. Sure. Asking someone how rich they are. We're just talking about what's up on the scoreboard, which (laughs) matters, but that's a result. And, you know, really one wants to be more concerned typically with the effort in the road to getting there. And how was that success established? So this must have been helping you find yourself. You know, George Bernard Shaw said that life isn't about finding yourself Life is about creating yourself. And usually when you get better answers uh, to asking about success, that can help you get on the road to building and establishing your personal brand and probably finding out who you want to be in the world. Yeah. (laughs) So um, I, I, I gave a little chuckle there because I think my earlier years, I was so ignorant to what anyone else thought I just kept going forward. And you see, today, we're we're in a very visual economy. You know, how do you look on TikTok? How do you look on your profile picture? How do you look on the videos you're doing on a podcast? How do I look? And when I was younger, I didn't care. You know, my, my thought was, look, if I can get you into that private party, if I can get you a drum lesson with Guns N' Roses, if I can get you into a private museum at midnight, then you'll talk to me. And so I never cared about how I sounded, how I showed up or what I looked like. So I never had any of those hurdles, any of those inferiority complex. So that was actually a very good way for me to get to the root of the actual question and to the root of the relationship by showing up as someone that I wanted to be. Today, 
Today, I run, a, I, I run a company with my son called Sims Media, and we're one of the largest, most successful personal branding companies out there. And here's the dumb thing. I wish we were out of business. Now, my son's probably hoping I don't say things like that, <laughs> but it's kind of sad when there are businesses that teach and train and educate you on to how to be you. You know, today we are so busy creating these, these profiles, these, these looks, these avatars, these facades of who we are. Twitter accounts with blue checks. Yeah, gives a shit, you know, and everyone's so hell-bent on getting a million followers and everyone's mortified if their latest video doesn't go viral, in air quotes. Now, here's the daft thing. I was doing a training program a little while ago for um, chiropractors. And I was doing a Q&A for this uh, speakeasy I was doing. And I said, so what are you looking for? And he went, I want a million views on my videos. And I said, okay, let's, let's play now. You want a million views on your videos, why? Because I want more clients. I said, do you want more clients or do you want more credibility? Ah, I want more credibility. So if more people are following me, that gives me the credibility to get the clients. Great, fine. How many clients do you want? And he went, 20. And I went, well, hang on a minute. That's your number? And he said, yeah, 20. I said, so let me get this right. You need a million viewers to get 20? The danger is with a million views, you're going to get more than 20. But let's ask a question. You want 20 clients. How many can you handle? He said, yeah, I could look after 20. I went, done. Magic wand. Tomorrow, 10 o'clock in the morning, your office suddenly has 20 people walk in at 10 a.m. all wanting your services. Can you handle them? He went, no. I don't have space for 20 at one time. So what's your number? And he went, I'd like three the first week and then three like two weeks later, giving me a chance to work with those new three plus my existing clients. And so every couple of weeks, if I had another three until I got another revolving 20, that'd be good for me. I said, so your number's three? Yes, somehow you picked out of your ass, you need a million views yeah. on this video for three. You don't need a million views. You need three conversations. And that's the problem we got today. In today's world, we're so focused on followers, blue check marks, going viral, all of this stuff that really shouldn't matter. What we should focus on is having a conversation and importantly, a connection with another human being. Real authentic connections with people. In a sense, one is eroding out their personal brand's potential if they tailor everything around an algorithm in the example that you gave us there, Steve. But you are such an expert in helping people find their personal brand. Why don't you talk to us some more about the tips that one can take on the road to finding the right personal brand for them? Part of that being authentic connection. Uh, there's, there's kind of a bit of a trickery in that question. The right personal brand, the right personal brand is the right you and the right you is the real you. See, here's the thing. You go into a room and it could have, and let's, let's focus on the real estate investors with opportunities. You're in a networking event. You know that everyone in the room can afford to partner with you and can get involved with you. So you've done the filtering pro. These are all good qualified potentials monetarily. Now, what you want to do, and Cameron Harold talks about this, you want to build a relationship based on shared culture. You see, I can teach someone to speak French. I can speak someone to write code, but I can't teach someone to share the same vision and belief and culture. Skill can be taught, culture can't. Bingo. So the whole point is when people walk into a room, the first devastating thing they do is they react to the other person to give them who they want them to see. Now, that's very confusing, okay, for them and for you. And I've been through this. You know, there was a point in my life where I'm dealing with, with billionaires, and I only dealt with billionaires, but I suddenly thought to myself, hang on a minute, I'm still wearing a black T-shirt riding around on a motorcycle. motorcycle. I better change. I bought a Ferrari. I started wearing tailor-made suits, and I bought an expensive watch, an MRP Joe Royal Oak Offshore with a custom dial. It was absolutely stunning, okay? And all of a sudden, get this, I started attracting more clients because I looked 
successful. But you know what was happening? I was attracting people that were attracted to my look and not to my personality, not to my culture. I was making more money with people that I had no connection with. And the effort it was taking me to become the facade of the person they wanted to keep the engagement. If you walk into a room as a solution to somebody else's interest or problem, yeah, all of a sudden what you look like and what you sound like it goes out the window because you're the solution to that problem. If I knock on your door at one o'clock in the morning and, you know, all of a sudden you're thinking, how the bloody hell does he know where I live? But let's forget that for a second. And, you know, I woke up your partner and I woke up the kids and the dogs barking and the cats screaming one o'clock in the morning. I woke up your house and your neighborhood. You're looking at me at one o'clock in the morning going, what are you doing? But if I suddenly turn around to you and I say, look, I'm so sorry, Keith, but I had to come around here because I'm just around the corner at a 24-hour diner with Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, and Richard Branson, and we got one more seat at the table and I thought of you. <laughs> now, are you still annoyed with me or are you hugging me and running out of room to get to that chair? I am grateful and you must have established quite a personal brand. There you go. So the, the point is, one of them is an aggravation. The other one is a solution. When you're an aggravation, there's a lot of cleanup and there's a lot of sales pitch and there's a lot of smooth, and I'm trying to attract you and I'm trying to engage you and I'm throwing you down a funnel. But if I'm a solution to your problem, you just want me. It's as simple as that. You know, warts and all, you want me. No one cares about me until a stranger knows how much I can help them. You're listening to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Steve Sims. He was called the modern day Wizard of Oz by Entrepreneur Magazine. More when we come back, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Americans are not saving for retirement. It's going to get worse as people live longer, so you need to think differently, but you can't lose your time. Real estate is the investment vehicle that has created more million and billionaires than anything else. Get Rich Education is one of America's top investing shows disrupting Wall Street. Your host, Keith Weinhold, is a true financial educator and has been an income property investor since 2002. Get Rich Education has created millions in passive monthly income for its followers. Now, Keith has a free course. Real estate pays five ways. Sign up now at getricheducation.com forward slash course. Invest in what produces income for you now and later. Use the link in the description to take the course for free. Real estate pays five ways. Get Rich Education is on every podcasting platform and has its own native iOS and Android apps. Join Get Rich Education Nation to create financial freedom through real estate investing. Subscribe wherever you listen. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with a remarkable person that has really made more of himself like few people have. His name's Steve Sims. You can learn more about him at stevedsims.com. He's the type of guy that turns the impossible into the possible for people with an expansionary mindset. I often like to say that don't live below your means grow your means. You can make so much more of yourself. And when you try to live below your means, you know, you kind of have a, a, a floor as to how far you can go down. When you try to expand your means, there's really no ceiling there and you're living better anyway. And, you know, Steve, you're such an expert at helping people sort of knock down walls and make more of themselves and, and deal with obstacles that people have in their life. And, um, you know, maybe your, your wife wants you to do the safe thing and keep that job and not buy these million dollar properties that create Create cash flow for you, or um, you know, maybe you're concerned about uh, being rejected by reaching out to someone that you admire, and you, you you sort of fear that sort of thing. So, Steve, tell us more about how one really knocks down some of those walls to make more of themselves. Are there any other thoughts about win-win? Because this does help you, you know, build your brand once you contribute to others and, and, and get those win-wins and get those collaborations. How else can someone think rather than thinking selfishly? So let's focus on that word brand yeah. for a second. It's become, you know, massaged, manipulated, stretched into all manner of different things as the, as the business world has expanded over the last years and decades. But let's understand what a brand is. A brand is what people say about you when you've left the room. Yeah. Now, if you sell kiddie shoes and your shoes come in every single color – 
and you go to a party, and then when you leave the party, everyone is talking about yours is the best place to get yellow shoes, then that's what your brand stands for, yellow shoes. So you've got to try and control the narrative. Now, to control the narrative, you've again got to understand what is a brand. And a brand falls into two sides. It's solution-based or it's aspirational-based. To understand the difference, how many times do you see an advert for a sports car and the advert for the sports car, the actual camera just sees a pair of hands on the steering wheel and is placing you in the car. And you look over and there's a beautiful woman with her hair tossing in the air. And that's putting you in that moment. You go, oh, my God, I wish I lived that life. And how many times do you see the adverts for Rolex, Odemar Pija, all of these watches that range from anywhere from $10,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars when we all know a $200 Apple watch is going to keep the time more accurately than any of those. But well, one signifies a status symbol. One of them is aspirational. Look at ladies' handbags. There's a, there's a reason why a Michael Kors handbag is X and a Birkin handbag costs this. And there's a reason why so many people want the Birkin handbag because, hey, it shows I've made it like the Gucci belt and all these other logos. So one of them is aspirational. Are you delivering a I've made it statement? If you are, you've got a lot of packaging to do. Okay. Think of Tiffany, all the blue boxes that it goes through. Okay. Aspirational. Okay. If you're solution based, all of that goes out the window. Do you care what your mechanic looks like when he's fixing your car? When you have a headache at two o'clock in the morning and you go to your bathroom cabinet and you grab out some headache tablets and you look at the bottle, when was the last time you went, no, nah, I don't like the logo. I'm going to find a different bag. <laughs> you never have. No one cares about branded when it's solution-based. When it's solution-based, you focus on it being the solution to your problem. And so you've got to work out, first of all, is your brand aspirational? Here's an example. Grant Cardone. I'm kind of guessing a few people out there know who he is. Sure. Is he solution-based or is he aspirational-based? And I'm asking you. I think he's pretty – I think he's pretty aspirational. Yeah, of course he is. He look, at my, look at my model sure. wife. And, yeah, he's a, I hear he's a great guy. Don't know him too well, so I'm not saying anything here. He's been look on the show here. Yeah, look at my jets, look at my car, look at where I'm going. I'm here. You know, I'm he's all very pumped up and loud and proud. He's very aspirational. You do this and you too could be me. That's what he's selling. Okay. He's selling the aspiration that you could be Grant Cardone. And then there's other people out there that say, hey, this is how you do your taxes and you save money. You do this, 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 this happens. That's a solution. So you've got to ask yourself when you're reaching out to people, whether it be to make an introduction, to make a connection, to get them to invest in you, to get them to joint venture, to get them to partner with you. Are you the aspirational? Hey, if you get with me, you too can have all of this. Or are you the, hey, you need to do this because there's a hole in your, in your workspace that I'm the solution for. Identify where you stand first as a brand and then fine tune it on that. And absolutely everyone has a brand. I was talking to my neighbor yes. one time and my landscaper Juan was doing some work in my backyard. And I was actually talking about branding and my neighbor happened to mention that, oh, like you're your landscaper there. He doesn't have a brand. I think everyone has a brand. They all have a, a set of systems and beliefs and maybe attention to detail or whatever. Everyone has a brand, including Juan, my landscaper. And I think that, beautiful man, well done. You've just pointed it out without trying, your landscaper has a brand because he has a brand because he has credibility, reputation, respectability, all of the elements. But here's the big element that he does have that you repeated a few times, clarity on what he does. Now, we built a branding company. We spend a good amount of time in that company. First things first getting rid of all the confusion that nine times out of 10 you've created. 
You see, today in a world of mass distraction and distortion and noise, we want clarity. I want to know that if I do this, that happens. I go there, I experience this. I buy that, that happens with it. I want the clarity. I want the simplicity. Trump, okay? Not here to talk about politics, but Trump won based on clarity. Now, you could have asked a four-year-old child, what was Trump's ambitions in becoming a president? And he would have gone, make America great, you know, build a wall. There were all of these slogans that were very, very clear and precise. It didn't matter if you agreed with them. They were crystal clear. Now, I've just named two, make America great and build a wall. Can you remember two that were actually being quoted by Hillary? That's a good point. I cannot. No, no one can. Most politicians are scared of actually putting a foot forward and declaring this is what I stand for. That rather can kind of like, well, you know, we are you worm around it. That's what politicians do. Trump came around with pure clarity, and a lot of people went, I don't understand, I don't agree with everything he says. You know, the guy's a, a philandering womanizer, but you know, he's clear with his message. You know, and that was it. Clarity today. We just want to know. We want to know where you're going, what you're doing. The rest of it, no one cares about. So in your brand, I'm going to ask you, everybody out there, how clear are you at what you do? If you buy properties that are, I don't know, trailer parks, are you the trailer park specialist or do you do all kinds of real estate? You know, do you do all kinds of real estate between this budget or are you all kinds of real estate? Again, how niched down are you in the clarity of what it is you actually do? That is a great point. Clarity in establishing one's personal brand, because people's lives are so busy, so full of options and choices that if you're not clear, you're going to lose somebody. Well, that really helps give us clarity on how to make a personal brand really shine, Steve. If someone wants to learn more about you and what you do and how you can help people and how you're such a motivator for people, what's the best way for them to connect and learn more about what you do? I've got a few options and and pretty much most of them are free. I've got an entrepreneur's advantage with Steve Sims. It's a free Facebook group, or you can just text the word Sims, S-I-M-S to 33777. Or here's something really easy. Steve D Sims. There's D for dashing and only one M in Sims. (laughs) Steve D Sims.com or anywhere you consume your media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Steve D Sims. Send me a message. Let me know you saw this show and you enjoyed it. Or even if you didn't, still send me a message. (laughs) It's been a valuable chat, Steve. Thanks so much for coming out of the show. Look after yourself.